Now, that's my view, but what do you think? Do you disagree? Do you have faith in President Joe Biden? Let me know. GBviews at gbnews.uk. I'm delighted to welcome my panel, who will be with me for the course of the show. Former editor of Labour List, Peter Edwards. GB News presenter and reporter, Inaya Follerin Iman. And policy director at the British Conservation Alliance, Connor Tomlinson. Um, let's start with you, Peter. Are you as worried about Joe Biden as I am? Well, I think we're all worried about Joe Biden. It's a massive policy failure. And the phrase, the buck stops here, I think was coined of the US president 60 or 80 years ago. Uh, America has made a terrible policy mistake. But I do feel um, your monologue at the start did collapse under the weight of its own rhetoric, really. Uh, I'm not really sure um, Biden's tears were crocodile tears. I don't think that's fair. And also, I think you rightly said there's a massive public policy failure and that's led to horrifying scenes and lives being lost in horrific circumstances at Kabul airport this week. But I think what you didn't say is what the alternative would have been. Is the alternative that the West stays in Afghanistan forever? Is it we withdraw boots on the ground and carry on bombing out Afghanistan? I wouldn't want to see that. I think it's an incredibly knotty policy problem. I think it's been mishandled by the Oval Office. But I do think your uh, take on it was incredibly simplistic and partial. Um, what do you think about this, uh, Connor? Do you agree? Has Peter got a point? Am I oversimplifying? I think it's an incredibly knotty policy problem because Biden doesn't show the strength while he is in office like the previous president did. If you're going to conduct a deal and have the other side come to the table and not act in good faith, then you need someone who has the hair trigger strength of President Trump. One of the good things about the media's completely biased coverage of him throughout his presidency was that they built him up overseas to be a man who, uh, as Kim Jong-un was afraid of, has a bigger red button on his desk than the other guy. Uh, so Joe Biden... The issue is the man backing the policy, not just the incompetent handling. Um, if you would like to say, oh, what's the alternative? The alternative was to go with the plan before and get the uh, civilians out that they had a massive list of on record and not give them all of the guns and then eradicate the uh, remaining camps and the biometric data that was behind and then take the troops out afterwards. And also, I don't think the uh, weight of the rhetoric to say that Joe Biden's tears were crocodile based. Um, one, he was one of the architects of the Iraq and Afghanistan invasion, with his brother standing to profit from the disastrous uh, uh, rebuilding efforts that happened afterwards. So he was happy to send other children's, uh, parents' children off to war. And then his own son, Hunter Biden, has wrecked in his foreign policy dealings in China and Ukraine a fair amount of his own uh, imperialistic profiteering damage. So I think, yes, it's tragic that Joe Biden lost a son, but to lean on that when uh, it's trying to obfuscate with, with emotionality away from his own foreign policy failings. I, I would agree it's probably crocodile tears. Wasn't it George Bush that invaded Iraq and not Joe Biden? Yes, he was a senator at the time and he voted for the Iraq war. And he campaigned for it, Peter. Yeah. Joe Biden did not invade Iraq. George Bush led it. Come on, let's be yeah, realistic. And, and he voted it. George Bush would not have been able to do the to invade Iraq if he did not have the constitutional approval at the time. And Joe Biden voted for it. And Peter, are you worried that Joe Biden's actions, which we can all agree have been uh, rather sort of ill-conceived, and this is a horrible mess right now, um, is he a discredit to the left? I don't think you can, uh, and I don't think you should withdraw uh, one conclusion about a US president with a totally different electorate in Britain. But I think what the British left has got to do and has done is make clear how sad and frustrated it is with Biden's actions. Biden's made lots of mistakes. Remember, he gave a, a different date for withdrawal, September 11th, and then suddenly realised that could inadvertently hand an additional propaganda coup to the evil people behind terror attacks on the West. So I think Biden's handling of this has been bad from the start, got worse, and it crystallised this week in those horrifying scenes at the airport. But I think we've got to be clear. I think I'm pleased the British Labour Party has been honest about what's gone wrong in America this week. But I think we've got to be very careful not to lump them together because the US Democratic Party is a very different beast to what you see in Britain. And we did see that, of course. Remember Bill Clinton, that um, smiling guy, you know, had a bit of Hollywood about him when he rocked up at Trimden Labour Club in, in Sedgefield in Tony Blair's constituency, a working men's club in the North East. Politics in America is very, very different to here. here. And I, I consider Joe Biden to be a dangerous president, given what's happened in the last week or so. What's your view? Well, I do think that it's morally justifiable leaving Afghanistan, but I think it's entirely legitimate to fundamentally critique the ways in which we have left. I think it has been catastrophic. And I do worry over the last kind of four years when President Trump 
what was leading America, why, rather than kind of um, building up this huge rhetoric about him being a fundamental threat to American democracy, that they weren't um, spending their time advising about much more moderate approaches to foreign policy rather than actually catastrophizing. But I do also worry about the kind of critique about what's going on, where it can seem that in an attempt to discredit Joe Biden, understandably, that some people that are critiques of Joe Biden, critics of Joe Biden, are somehow framing it as if, you know, actually we need to be building up the military industrial complex and actually we should be in Afghanistan much more as a kind of reaction against Joe Biden. I do think that actually the Dow has now moved in terms of foreign policy that happened even before um, Joe Biden. I think that is now time for the West to really reassess what his place is within the world rather than actually just freaking out over everything that's happened without actually thinking about what position we want to be in now going forward. I mean, I've just received a message in, Peter, from uh, Danol, who says Joe Biden must be impeached at once. Not only has he betrayed the people of Afghanistan and his own military and his NATO allies, he's armed the Taliban and given them an air force. Shameful behaviour and decisions, also using the death of his son to manipulate the situation. What's the legal basis for impeaching Joe Biden? That lives are in peril. So, for example, America is now going to be a greater terrorist target, as indeed will the UK, because clearly Afghanistan can be a fantastic breeding ground, not just for the Taliban, but other terror groups. I think nearly every American president in 20th century and 21st century has bombed other countries. They've not been impeached. Well, we do know that the grounds for impeachment for, for Donald Trump were, were very shaky. Um, and I think that it was actually um, the previous uh, opposition in America, the Democrats at that time, which essentially um, normalised uh, this kind of idea that you should impeach a president every time you disagree with something that they do. Exactly. It's a nonsense, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, Peter, I mean, wouldn't you like to see him go? I don't think he's up to the job, is he? Biden, would I like to see him go? Yeah. Well, I as mean, with all these things, after what's, what's happened, the alternative? A man, a, a man of principle, after what's happened, surely he would reflect and stand down. Well, because he's presided over such a disaster. If I was Joe Biden, I would consider my position. Yeah, but I think your politics are very different to that of Joe Biden. The other observation I have is that when the people are prime minister or president, that's a huge amount of power and they tend not to give it up very easily. Now, the, la the only president that I can remember quitting is Richard Nixon. Come on, let's be serious. Biden, what Biden's done has been a disaster. It's also going to, I think, uh, perhaps get gradually more unpopular in the US. But is he going to resign? Of course not. I think you're riding two horses at once. One horse is about Biden's physical and mental fitness, mm. which basically none of us know about because certainly I'm not a doctor. Uh, except, except when we watch him, Peter. OK, so, so we're guessing from several thousand miles away as to his health. That, to me, is not that rigorous. This, is a, you... this is a guy that can't finish a sentence, Peter. I mean, he's clearly... Well, I, th I think uh, you can he's... say that about a lot of politicians. OK, yeah, but he couldn't cite the Declaration of Independence. He said, all men are created, you, you, you know the thing. He's dribbling in his own lap. Like, look, Joe Biden wasn't an excellent politician during his career. He was done for plagiarism the first time he ran for president. He, he, in, he said some fairly strange things about Obama. On the campaign trail, he said, if black people don't vote for him, you ain't black. He's had a fair few gaffes, all right? He was never the greatest of dogs. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. But you especially don't stick a dog in Crofts when it's already out to lunch. He actually got lost on his way into the White House a few days ago. <laughs> <laughs> but none of, to be fair, though, none of these things were unknown before he um, got elected. This was part of the conversation that happened That's a scary um, in, in the run-up. And I do think we have to respect that he was a democratically elected president. But and if exactly. the Americans want to get rid of him, then they can wait until maybe the midterms where he might lose lots and lots of um, states or whatever, or even later on when they actually can, can re-elect uh, the president. Can I pick up on that quickly? Because, Mark, you're saying, should we get rid of him? But, but what is your alternative? He won the election, fair and square, as Anaya said. You don't like him. You think he might uh, be unfit physically, but you're not sure and you haven't offered I, any what, evidence. What, what I think, What's Peter, your alternative? What I think is that I, I think that the Democrats should find somebody else to do the job. I, I do well, agree with that. Like the, the, the Constitution doesn't work in such a way that you can actually suddenly have a snap election. I understand that. But I think that the Democratic Party should have an honest moment of self-reflection and realise they chose the wrong person. I agree with you, Peter. I think he has a mandate for four years. But I, I am riding two horses. I think his judgment has been found wanting uh, with this botched departure, which will cost lives and make the West uh, a less safe place. And I also don't believe that he's in good cognitive health. But, but what, you haven't offered an alternative. I think there is a degree... A new of president, a new democratic president. Yeah, there's, hold on. There's a degree of... What you say does not make sense. There's a degree of consensus in Britain, 
in the left and the right that the events of this week have been horrifying and partially avoidable. Clearly, we're going to have to pull out of Afghanistan at some point, but presidents don't just resign like the junior minister for paperclips in Britain might. So if you want to get rid of him and you haven't offered a legal basis for impeachment, how? There Peter, is, Peter actually, let me give you a let quick Mark example. Connor, Connor, I'll give you the last word, but Peter, if Margaret Thatcher had lost the Falklands War, she would have resigned. Correct. What's your point? Well, this is a military defeat. In fact, this is arguably much worse than losing the Falklands War. I don't think they're really comparable, though, because Margaret Thatcher... This is Thatcher much started... worse. Losing the Falklands War would have been a disaster, but it wouldn't have imperiled the Western world. I'm afraid that's a very uh, inaccurate comparison. Margaret Thatcher... We'd have lost the Falklands Islands. Margaret Thatcher began the Falklands War and she stewarded the Falklands War. Joe Biden did not begin the Iraq War or the Afghan oh, War. So he's not, he's not in charge. He's not making the decisions, Peter. I think we all know, quite obviously, Joe Biden was not president in 2001. So, of course, he didn't make the decision to invade Afghanistan. Connor's pointed out a vote for it. I think you're barking up the wrong tree with a comparison to Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher led her party and the country into the Falklands War. Joe Biden did not lead America into <laughs> Afghanistan. That's just a fact. Connor, brief last word, if you will. That's fine. First of all, are we forgetting Joe Biden was vice president for eight years under Obama in the same war rooms that were bombing uh, Afghan weddings and killing civilians? And second of all, there is actually a method of legal recourse to remove the president without an impeachment proceeding. It's the 25th Amendment, which says that if you are mentally unfit for the role, you can be removed. It's what they were trying to talk about with Trump, and it's also what they were trying to talk about with Reagan when they said he had Alzheimer's. So there's a possibility. But I actually agree with Peter here, and I think that uh, President Kamala Harris would be a much more terrifying prospect. So isn't it scary that... Progressivism is actually more terrifying than the man who's dribbling in his own lap, being the leader of the free world. At, well, so many issues to tackle there. Um, Connor, what do you think? Is Brexit to blame for empty supermarket shelves? I think if Brexit's to blame, then the blame lies more on the side of the EU bureaucracy gumming up the works. I've seen divorce uh, settlements fairer than this deal. We're essentially paying billions to do something we should have done ages ago. And it's very clear that much like a jealous ex-wife. The EU isn't too keen on us leaving because we're not a part of the European project and especially because we were the leading export from Germany, an importer, um, which we've actually now rewarded China for unleashing the pandemic on us by replacing that with them. You can see why they're a little bitter, but it doesn't justify uh, them creating extra roadblocks at uh, import and export as with the Northern Ireland um, issue. However, I think the main issue is, again, the, the pandemic. They're saying in the Guardian article, we can't get Brits to fill the jobs. Well, there's a simple solution, and both left and right politicians have said this. How about the supermarkets use their record pandemic profits, seeing as they were the only bloody thing open, mm. to increase the wages of the drivers and incentivise hiring more of those, especially when we know they've got a lot of those profits and they're diverting them to social causes like Sainsbury's, etc. Well, yes, I think, Connor, you raise a good point there. John Redwood, of course, keen Brexiteer. He joined me on this programme uh, last weekend, and he's tweeted the following. Business can solve the driver shortage by raising wages, as you said, and improving working conditions. Just recruit and train some more, because that's the issue, Connor. It's the lack of drivers. And the reason why is it's not an attractive occupation. Well, I would say it's, it, it's not a, it's an unattractive occupation, because if the pay is well, then a lot of people are happy to sacrifice their time, even in the evenings. Uh, I know a lot of guys prefer solitary work, especially a lot of introverts. Jobs yeah. are geared for all sorts of people. Um, but it's, it's definitely the driver problem, especially because they're having the same problem in America. So that can't be blamed on Brexit. They've got the same supply line issues. And a lot of that is because uh, we had furlough over here. They had the, uh, what was the, they had two rounds of essentially government handouts over there. And it got to the point where fast food places, for example, were giving out checks just to come to the interview because the government handout payments were higher than the wages for the month. So they need to get uh, uh, more people in the door doing the interviews and then sitting uh, bums on seats in the trucks by upping the pay, because that's the only way that you'll get a, a non-interventionist uh, way to reinstart the economy and reopen the supply lines. Anaya, is this Remainers uh, seeking to blame Brexit for something that goes far beyond our exit from the European Union? Well, I was a big supporter of Brexit, but even in the run-up to the campaign, I don't think any ardent Brexiteer is under any illusion that there would be wouldn't be any teething problems. And I do think that a lot of the promise of Brexit hasn't been fully realised, particularly as we've had the pandemic, which has scuffered 
many things. And I do think that we are likely to see some issues ar around kind of supply chains and movement as we still figure out some of the ropes and making sure that we make sure that we have lots of things covered in, re in regards to our relationship with the European Union. So I do think there may be relations with, the, the, it might be related to, to Brexit um, in some way, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be resolved. And I very much agree. I think that actually um, it's quite silly, I would say, that we have an economic model that relies on the continual importing of low-skilled, low-paid people from um, other countries that often need um, those people for their own societies. And I think that if we did invest in training and making sure that we incentivize and people to do all types of work that can be regarded as attractive if it has better paying conditions and is fair, then I think that we would have more people in this country doing those jobs. So I think that um, when people often on the kind of ardent Remain side use this to say that, oh, Brexit was awful, well, I question this idea that actually I'm continually bringing in people from from poorer parts of the world in order to fill in gaps in our country i don't think that's a very sustainable model or good for the people in our society as well uh, peter briefly if you can uh, is this the fault of brexit empty supermarket shelves yes and what i want to talk about is the uk government no one has mentioned the uk government where are they the referendum was five years ago people like me who vote remain we accept the result Fine. But it's down to various British governments to make the best of it, and they have not done so. This chaos was foreseeable, and it shows how Brexit fundam fundamentally undermines the UK economy. And then the pandemic comes on top, puts us in an even worse position. The HGV, the haulier, the supermarket delivery and supply chain problems could have been foreseen. They could have been mitigated. Why hasn't the government done it? But do you think, Anaya, that restaurants should cater for celiacs? Well, I do think that it is good in, in this day and age when there are lots of different dietary requirements, mm. such as vegans and vegetarians and gluten-free, that it is good, makes good business sense, essentially, to cater to different types of people. But I think this example just shows what social media has really done. Ordinarily, if there was a disgruntled customer, they might have, you know, said a few horrible things to the manager and never gone again and maybe said a few things to their friends. But yeah, now they take, have... Take their, take their business elsewhere. Well, absolutely. And now they have access to potentially tens of thousands of people can say things that many, many people can see without any consequences, which could really damage kind of small and independent businesses who really rely on positive word of mouth. So I think it's just a very nasty thing to, to do to a kind of small business. Also, you could argue that this lady running this small cafe was being honest because actually it's very hard to guarantee that wheat hasn't got into any of the food chain in a cafe. Yes, I have a lot of uh, sympathy for the entrepreneur behind the cafe. And, you know, when you run a small business, you're subject to all sorts of rules and regulations, rightly, for health and safety. And I, mm. I don't think it's particularly scandalous that trading standards visit because that's their job, yeah. visit cafes. But I think the, the Facebook mob is very unfair. And I actually think market forces will come out. Cast your mind back 20 or 30 years, vegan and vegetarian meals were very scarce in pubs and restaurants. Why did... Uh, restaurateurs, people, pub landlords changed that. It wasn't necessarily out of altruism. It's because there was demand for it. Yeah. So they wanted to sell more meals. So just as there's more vegan meals available now and the stuff that is nut free, so there'll be more uh, meals that suit celiac. So market forces will change it. And choice is always a good thing. Well, definitely. But at the moment, I, I wonder whether it would be financially very difficult for a small cafe to say we are entirely gluten free. Because if you've, I don't know, chopped a ciabatta in half and, and then used that knife to produce another meal for someone that's celiac, then there's enough wheat, possibly, enough debris yeah, to you, actually you, cause, the, cause a reaction. And, and so actually, for, for, you know, creating a vegan menu is probably easier than making sure that there's just no wheat. In a dish. But can't you just have distinct areas? We know some food factories where, you know, mm. a food factory is 100 times the size of a Cornish cafe. Uh, they have separate areas for food production, whether that's for religious and cultural reasons mm. or nut allergies or things like celiac. So, of course, if we can put a man on the moon, you know, I think we can keep... But, I mean, you've got things like, for example, I don't know, uh, just as an example, maybe chips are made in a deep fat fryer and some chips are actually coated in breadcrumbs yeah, or, or you know and, 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 and it, that goes into the oil and then you fry something that a celiac's going to eat i mean you know does a small cafe have those resources i think a small cafe you know they may be able to afford more than one cooker you just have distinct areas but it's mm. a problem you know for me as a non-meat eater when you get a takeaway you say what's this veggie item being cooked in yeah and sometimes you get an answer you don't like if it's a you know eight hours of beef drippings from the rest of the beef burgers. But, you know, mm. 
Good on the cafe owner for being transparent. What do you think about this, Con? Well, I was going to say, as uh, someone who can be assassinated by a Snickers bar and whose EpiPens <laughs> are in his pocket, um, you can't actually guarantee, even with distinct areas, that you're ever going to have 100% uh, non-contamination. Um, sometimes, uh, they even said in Facebook posts in that celiac group, with uh, among the threats to bash them overhead with kitchen utensils, that we are so concerned that it's airborne. Well, if it's airborne, as my nut allergy is, um, uh, the most you can do is, you know, for example, say, oh, don't sell peanuts on planes, etc. But it also means you've got to have a modicum of personal responsibility and mm. weigh up your risks. And sometimes you're going to have to cross items off the menu. You can't expect the, the restaurant to pay for that. That's just entitlement. So, so what is, if, if you have a nut allergy, which you do, yeah. what, how do you order without imperiling yourself? You just have to ask if the restaurant's got the menu of uh, these are our allergen items, mm. and then you can never 100% guarantee so you've got to take the risk. Otherwise, I wouldn't get on public transport, for example, because someone could be eating a bag of salted KP at the back and I can just I mean, would you, would you react to that if you were in the proximity of someone eating nuts? Possibly, yeah, because it's just a, it's just a level of severity. People have it sort of like rank ordered, but I'm, I'm one of those people that might just be, if I sniff it, then uh, that sets me off. When, so. did, you, uh, when did you have uh, the first symptoms of a nut allergy? Uh, I was six and I used to really like carrot cake, and right before I I went to the dentist, I had a bit, and then I was traipsing around boots, and uh, I thought I was just feeling funny because my mum was taking me shopping and I really wanted to go home and play Nintendo, but apparently <laughs> not. Um, I then got carted back. And uh, then the second time was, I, uh, it was, I remember the Robin Hood, Christmas special on Christmas Eve. Um, my dad was sick of me eating the orange creams in the Quality Street box. He went, go Try another one, I'll let you have the lot. And unfortunately, he gave me a Brazil nut one, and I conked out. So the next day, he made me breakfast and let me watch Transformers early. <laughs> and you really have to sort of work your life around this allergy, I would have thought. I mean, yeah, you have is, to, is it you have a to perpetual navigate. worry? Um, well, it was when I was a kid because I was more of a worrier. But yeah. as, as you understand your. Uh, your role for being personally responsible for yourself and you understand that existential risks lie everywhere. Um, you'd be hiding behind the sofa if you were concerned that you wouldn't cross the road. Uh, yeah. So you've just, you've just got to take a gamble, unfortunately. And as, as every package says, even if it says made in a factory using night ingredients, well, you've, you've just got to take that chance. Yeah, uh, fascinating stuff. Well, Mamma Mia, here we go again. Yes, folks, after 39 years, the Swedish sensations ABBA are reportedly on the comeback trail. Surely this is the tonic we need post-pandemic. The band is said to be releasing new music next Friday. New music! New ABBA songs in what will be the first new tracks by Bjorn Ulveus, Benny Anderson, Agneta Faltskog and Annefrid Lingstadt in almost four decades. The group had originally started planning their long-awaited comeback in 2019, but the pandemic scuppered that idea. The quartet are also preparing to launch a show called ABBA Voyage, which features their younger selves beamed on stage as ABBA stars and performing a range of classic hits and will be performed in a purpose-built theatre in East London next month. Excited about this, Connor? I am definitely the wrong audience for this. Um, you're better off asking my mum and sister well, you're for You're so one. young, we'd have to explain who ABBA are. Oh, is. no, no, I'm, I'm definitely not too young for that. Um, I'm, I'm, my music taste is slightly more highbrow than, than all the modern stuff, but ABBA's just too cheap. So what do you go for? Uh, I'm, okay, well, here's, I'm going to embarrass myself. I like, I like a bit of like soft rock 80s sort of stuff. Nothing wrong with that. No, um, the thing I do actually take issue with this though, is with the holographic projection thing, it seems very morbid because this was the subject of one of the Black Mirror episodes with Miley Cyrus in it. And you can essentially <laughs> repurpose an artist long after they're gone uh, yeah. and, and trot up their visage way after they're, they're incapable of live performing. It's a bit ghoulish and it actually removes the, the exclusivity and the authenticity that makes art art. I'm, I'm a little bit unnerved by it. Yes, and also, Peter, that doesn't really feel like a comeback tour if it's just a projection. Yeah, it does seem a bit stars. of a halfway house. I think, you know, we all enjoy a bit of ABBA, whether you, if you've ever been to either a wedding reception or a student disco, you've probably heard ABBA <laughs> at some point. I'm a bit sceptical about this. I mean, I guess my question would be, can you think of a pop comeback that has been as good as the first time round. Yeah, well, that's a really good point. I mean, if you could bring back a band, living or dead, who would it be? Oh, I've no idea. I mean, the bands I listen to most are probably people like Massive Attack, but if I could bring anyone back, it would have to be Mozart or Beethoven. Mm, that's not a bad shout, <laughs> is it? Um, Inaya, ABBA fan? Yeah, I am, 
I think many of their songs are classics. I think they've probably got to the stage where they transcend their specific time and many people just recognise their songs. I think it's great. I mean, I do agree with the... So there's something obviously quite fundamentally missing about projection. I think someone, an artist, did it with two packets several years ago and it just obviously yeah. didn't have that feel. But I, I do love a good comeback. I think uh, Spice Girls have done it a couple of times. I, I think once they sorted out the technical issues, the, the Spice Girls tour was quite successful. And a friend of mine went and said it was amazing. Oh yeah, I think I think it sold out one of the, the quickest um, in, in history, something like 38 seconds or something ridiculous yeah. like that. So I think that, you know, as generations grow up, it brings nostalgia, you connect to something from the past. So I think it's really great. And also I'm quite excited at the idea of new material. The idea of new ABBA songs is definitely welcome because one of the saddest things about losing John Lennon, of course, sadly, Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stones died earlier this, this week, um, that you could just only imagine all the songs we would have had from John Lennon if he hadn't tragically died so young. Yeah, I mean, I do wonder, though, because sometimes I, I wonder if they do try and give it a kind of modern twist. And I think sometimes it doesn't really land as well when they're trying to stay relevant. But if mm. it's still got some of those older sounds that resonate um, from, from when it was back then, I think it could still be powerful. But if it's trying to, to reinvent itself in a modern way. We, we, we obviously can't bring back Mozart or Beethoven or sadly all of the Beatles, but can we agree that an Oasis union would be nice? Uh, an Oasis reunion? I'm a Blur man. Blur? Yeah. So, not having it. My first album was Gorilla's Demon Days, so I've, I'm, I'm going to have to take the other side in this culture. Yeah, Connor picked a side and you chose, you chose Blur. Well, I'm like to be a contrarian, what can I say? <laughs> okay. But an Oasis reunion? That's what the world. What if it ends in a punch up between the brothers? I mean, yeah, this is how, how it ended last time. <laughs> That's what we want. That's what you're paying for, is the punch up at the end. Um, lots more to come. We are taking a look at the stories which will be making tomorrow's headlines. And in a few minutes time, my amazing panel will choose their greatest Britain and union jackass. Former editor of Labour List, Peter Edwards. GB News' very own Inaya Follerin Iman and policy director at the British Conservation Alliance, Connor Tomlinson, are still with me. Now, let's take a look at this one, a new campaign urging every workplace in the UK to offer a pet bereavement leave policy. That's right, pet bereavement leave policy when their pet passes away. They launched the campaign a few days ago. Pet wellness experts itch were inspired to push forward the policy following the high rise of pet adoptions during lockdown, which saw dog adoptions across the UK increasing by almost 15% in 2020. The policy encourages employers to give paid leave for employees if a pet dies, with nearly three quarters of Brits agreeing that their furry friend is a valued member of the family. More than half of pet owners think that the death of a pet is just as hard to deal with as a human one. And around one in 10 stated that their employer showed no sympathy. But what are your thoughts? Should we get time off for the bereavement of furry friends? Have you had a positive experience? with your employer, GB Views at gbnews.uk. Connor, are you a pet owner? Uh, no, family have been. I did have a dog, but then we moved to the house. It was a bit too catastrophic to keep her around. Um, also, she used to jump at her own reflection in the door, <laughs> so she wasn't the brightest bulb. But the family, I am going to be King Kildrew on the couch here and say, as much as I understand the emotional attachment that people have to their pets, please do yourself a favour and show some emotional fortitude. Don't use it as a, a sort of crutch that you will get time off work because people undoubtedly will. Um, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm at leisure to say that people will uh, allow this as, a, as an excuse to remove themselves from the competitive work environment for any sort of loose reason. People are going to exploit it, but also good natured people will use this as an excuse to not be particularly stoic. And I think that does people favours. I see. So you think it actually sort of feeds the idea of a kind of snowflake generation. It's encouraging people to feel sorry for themselves and, and be morally weak. Yes. And it's, it's, it's adding to the list of reasons to be... Uh, uh, to be evictive. Yeah, essentially so. Uh, what do you think, Peter? Do you, uh, do you have any pets in, in Bow in East London? I don't have any pets. And I'm not sure about this idea of moral weakness. I think that's a bit <laughs> Victorian. But um, I think employers should be sympathetic. Sure, it's a sad event. But I think allowing statutory time off for a pet bereavement is really just barking up the wrong tree. Oh, nicely done. Uh, I, I, 
<laughs> think I, uh, I disagree with both of you, actually, because I think uh, to lose a cat that maybe has been in your life for 18 or 19 years or a dog that's been with you for 15 years could be quite devastating, Anaya. And I've certainly felt that the grief of losing a pet has been, you know, close to that of losing a loved one. I mean, I do wonder, is it, is it only kind of furry pets? Does it include goldfish <laughs> yes, I and know, other that's things? A I mean, that's one of the things Gerbil. that I was thinking about. Yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> we should <laughs> limit it to mammals. OK, well... <laughs> Don't maybe, you? Maybe, maybe that's the solution. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd probably agree with what's already been said. I think it, there does seem to be an increasing list of things for people to be able to, to get off work. And I think that... Whilst it's sad and, and, and understandably sad, I don't think it's necessarily a strong enough excuse. And I do think it seems part of this wider um, desire to, to kind of make animals this exact same as human beings in terms of, you know, with, with animal rights and all of these things. Obviously, nobody wants animal cruelty, but I do think we have to make sure we differentiate between the impact of a loss of a human Although life. Although I, I have known people to be in bits at the, the loss of a pet, you know, where they, they are actually not able to function in a normal way, that they're not fit for the workplace. You know, yeah. I've had friends and loved ones that can barely speak because they're so consumed with grief. Uh, you know, not for months on end, but certainly in, in, in the days after losing a pet. Yeah, and I think maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, if that is, if they're completely incapable of you know, doing work, then they can have that conversation with their employer. But I think as a kind of basis of something normal, mm. I think that's just taking it way too far. Wow. OK. Well, what do you think? Are they being a little harsh, my panel? <laughs> GBviews at gbnews.uk. I, I would say um, there's a compromise, perhaps a day off if a pet has died isn't unreasonable. But that's just my opinion. Now, times are changing and so is the way that we pay for things. Gone are the days of coin-filled pockets or cash-filled wallets and in its place, plastic cards and our smartphones. Tap-and-go payments are about to simplify our lives and make checkout even easier because the cap now on single payments is £100 or it's going to be very, very shortly. So in the pandemic, we've seen it creep up from 45 quid, and it will be on the 15th of October, £100. But despite the assurances of the Chancellor for a secure and easier way to shop, some financial experts warn that the increased limit means easier transactions on stolen or lost cards and opens a gateway for those in debt to keep spending without checking. So what do we think? Should we embrace the cashless society and I? Well, I think it does hugely add convenience. I think it's been great during the pandemic and people have been concerned about, you know, contact and things like that. But my worry about the cashless society is actually on a kind of free speech basis. I think actually uh, I worry that companies, um, if, if they have people that they fundamentally disagree with politically, um, they don't have an alternative if they, for example, froze their bank account. This has actually happened in many instances. We've seen it with PayPal, we've had seen it with Patreon, with YouTubers, that they disagree with, they're no longer able to access their subscription money. And I do think there should have to be an alternative available for people to use, um, such as physical cash. That's definitely a concern. Also, you lose the informality of cash, don't you, Peter? So, for example, tipping um, a, a waiter or a waitress after a meal, you know, leaving a, a fiver on, 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 on the plate when you leave, uh, or possibly somebody that's on their uppers that you encounter in the street who could just do with a couple of quid for the bus home uh, or indeed to find a hostel and you can't really ask somebody that's homeless if they take credit cards. As you say, so many industries and much charitable giving relies on cash, that's one worry. Another one I have is if you abolish cash, which I'm completely against, then you're removing choice. Yet yeah, in the 21st century, every, uh, every other industry, mobile phones, TV, sport and so on, is about expanding choice. So why would we reduce choice now? It seems like going backwards. Mm. Um, is it inevitable that cash will be the secondary currency, though? No, it's not inevitable at all. Why would it be? Because most people will opt for the, the convenience of a credit card. I mean, I, I can pay for stuff at Tesco just using my phone now. Some people pay with their watch. They'll never go back to kind of coins and notes after that, will they? Well, I see people in the supermarket uh, paying with cash. You, you brought one device mm. out of your jacket pocket to pay a phone, but I have another device called a wallet that I can yeah. pay, pay for my loaf of bread with, and they each take roughly the same amount of time. But um, I know my £10 note isn't going to have an IT failure. Although I wonder, do you think it might be quite good for the economy if we went cashless? I mean, it would reduce costs on business, wouldn't it? Especially smaller outlets having to make sure they've got enough change in the till. Well, no, I'm not sure it 
would because you know the cost of a float is pretty modest and if you're as an i said you know if you're mm. a market trader and you don't have uh, one of these chip and pin devices or whatever mm. else you've got enormous startup costs and that's also a barrier to entry whereas you know traditionally people have come into things like markets i live in the east end um, on a very, very casual, intermittent basis. So you're increasing the barriers to entry. It makes it hard of could make quite, it hard for people to set up small firms. Quite a few markets, though, and market stalls actually do take card payments, and they have these little devices. And, but, and, but then I it mean, goes to choice, doesn't it, it? It is choice, but I mean, they, they're potentially able to make quicker sales. And the problem with that, you know, post-pandemic, people are not used to having cash in their pockets anymore. There was a point in the pandemic where retailers were unhappy to take cash because they were worried that COVID would be spread via the notes. So I think the public have kind of got out of the cash habit. And I wonder whether businesses, if they want income, will have to accept card payments. Well, I don't agree. And I, I live in London. I think it's different, different parts of the country. But I, I was really confused because during the pandemic, I went into some cafes for takeaway at the height of lockdown. Uh, we know we're all doing our walks around the city uh, yeah. in, the, in the middle of winter because it was the only place we could see our friends. But some cafes said card payment only some said cash payment only yes but they, they both had a hard and fast rule but they were the complete opposite of the other yeah and i'm even just thinking about even little things like if a if a young kid wanted to set up a cake sale or something little like that i mean yeah you, you, they won't have a card well i bought a big machine. issue two days ago from somebody i had no cash and they said it's not a problem i've got one of these machines <laughs> but i mean the other issue peter is is the cost to small businesses of online um Ex uh, exchange of cash because actually the, the credit card companies charge retailers for every transaction, don't they? Yeah, so, so it's an extra cost for them. Mm. Well, that's what I was alluding to earlier. And for, as an I said, you know, think about the smallest, smallest businessman or woman. It, it, it might be a teenager selling something out of a passion or interest. Then that goes on to become their livelihood. So we're talking really, really small sums of money. And if they've got to cough up for a card machine as well, it makes life that little bit harder for them. Mm. What do you think about this, Connor? Well, my concern is both with the idea that the economy would be better off. I would disagree, especially because if you're going to centralise the currency and, and not have it backed by some sort of standard, like the Americans did after the war with the gold standard, they got rid of it. It's meant to be temporary, like every government programme. It opens it up to more manipulation, like we see with China and, and with their currency inflation, and also incentivise a lot more debt. We've got a lot of irresponsible spending, especially during lockdown. And also the convenience angle you said about, it's pretty worrying that convenience will be a... a uh, large-scale incentive for massive social change because that's going to be the argument that's trotted out when immediately, as uh, Anaya said about uh, having your bank account withdrawn, if there's any kind of social credit system with uh, vaccine passports, with your social media ID, with your uh, all, all online um, currency, then you can be deplatformed entirely mm. in one stroke. And I, I think we want to keep these sort of things decentralised. Uh, but what about crime and corruption? Because actually, if we have a cashless society, that's bad news for criminals, isn't it? I, possibly, but the safest sort of financial technology are actually being developed in the private sphere in terms of blockchain, where you can retrace those sorts of things. Mm. If we eliminated those with a purely cash society, with a Bitcoin idea that, that Rishi Sunak wants to do, mm. um, that would halt that sort of development in the private sphere, put it straight in the hands of the state, mire it in bureaucracy, and we'd actually lose uh, a lot of that uh, transparency. But, but what about cash in hand, for example? If you think about you know, tax evasion, if you mm. think about people that are just working for cash and not declaring their income. I mean, this could be good news for the Treasury as well, Anaya. I mean, I mean, possibly, but people that are doing cash in hand, it tends to be like smaller amounts and people, you know... I don't know. I think, well, I think HMRC would, uh, well, would, would well, question well, that. Uh, well, I think I, there are some people uh, earning qu quite a substantial daily rate, but they're just not declaring it. Well, I do think there's always a possibility for fraud, but I know that people, for example, that are undocumented mm. and things like that, that is one of the only ways that they can make money or they'll be, be um, apprehended by, by immigration services. So I do yeah. think there is a possibility for fraud regardless, but I do think having that choice is really important. Well, it seems to be a collective thumbs down <laughs> for a cashless society from my panel. Uh, let's talk about fitness because the COVID vaccine may have killed something other than a virus with Peloton having slashed their bike prices as fitness enthusiasts return to reopened gyms. The company has reported apparently uh, that they've slashed their bike's price by $750 after reporting that they predicted a reduction in over $100 million in revenue next year. The popular at-home fitness equipment maker rocketed in popularity during the pandemic as people who were desperate to stay, stay fit whilst gyms were closed bought its bikes. However, on Thursday, the company's stock price dropped by 
Uh, almost 2% shares down nearly 24% overall. The CEO, John Foley, hopes the company will return to profitability by 2023. But is this the end of home exercising? And did you ever start? So there you go. I don't know if you bought, did you buy any fitness equipment in lockdown? Nope. Not really? <laughs> Absolutely not. I rotted in my chair until I was able to go back to gym and deadlift. So. I see. So were you, did you actually neglect your exercise needs in the course of the pandemic? Um, well, to be fair, the only sort of thing I would have been able to do other than uh, uh, use the most pitiful weights possible would have been cardio. And I've got a metabolism like a jet engine. So if I wanted to lose more weight, <laughs> you know, uh, it's probably the best bet. I stay planted firmly on my backside. The thing I would question actually, though, is Peloton... Um, I wonder if there's a form of social backlash because Peloton, and it was broadcasted uh, pretty mm. notably, they collated a list of, uh, they were celebrating the companies doing it, but obviously if you have a list like this, people are going to use it to boycott. Um, Peloton was one of the main companies that donated a large amount to BLM during the riots last year. So I wonder how many, com uh, how many people were actually put off buying Peloton bikes because of the social cause they support. Interesting, interesting angle. Um, so uh, what about exercising at home? Did you take to that at all, Peter? I mean, I can see your body's a temple. It's a very slim line panel tonight. I've got to say. Well, we're all, we're all very slim, whether through accident or design, are we? As, as are you. But no, I, I mean, I, I live near a park, and I think, like a lot of us, I did uh, vast amounts of walking in lockdown, as I was saying earlier, because it's one way to see your friends at the height of lockdown in a safe way. You know, you go for a walk, uh, in our case, around London, it was very chilly, and you have a coffee. The thing I want to say about the exercising at home, though, is every time you ever read the colour supplement of a newspaper and their health pages, it's always about doing stretches and exercises rather than cardiac it's about um keeping your flexibility into old age and that apparently is what will keep us all going i think that's a great shout anaya i mean it is sport <laughs> no it's not really for me i do like the gym um, even though i haven't gone for for over a year but i think um, you've got a good excuse <laughs> but people always say during the pandemic it was either hunk, hunk or chunk you either really got into exercise or oh, you gained it? lots hunk or chunk? yeah or nice. gained lots and lots of weight and <laughs> um, so yeah I, I was the one that gained weight i think <laughs> during the pandemic well i think you're all wearing it very well uh, it's time now for this Yes, it's time for my panel to reveal their greatest Britain and union jackass. So, Inaya, I'll start with you. Who are you backing tonight? Well, I've decided to back all of the people that have helped the Afghan refugees and Afghan people get to the UK to seek safety. I mean, I've seen lots of really remarkable images of them arriving and settling in, and I just think it's really powerful when we've had so many conversations about migration and, and kind of cracking down on, on refugees and asylum seekers. But this is a reminder of why that UN convention is actually really important. Yeah, great shout. A brilliant nomination. Peter, your greatest Britain. Well, I was actually going to say something virtually the same. It's been a team effort in Kabul. Yeah. Every soldier, male and female, every humanitarian worker and every diplomat doing their best in some quite appalling circumstances. So uh, it's been a brilliant team effort. And I think we all feel um, Sadness what we've seen, but great pride at some of the reaction as well. Brilliant shout. Connor, your greatest Britain. Uh, uh, specifically, as for the Afghan venture, it's Penn Farthing, who has just, in breaking news recently, got his Project Arc flown over to the UK. Yeah. It's been very nice seeing um, Sandwich between my segment on Monday nights and talk radio. Kevin O'Sullivan's been covering this pretty closely, and uh, it's yeah. been a very harrowing circumstance, but it's good news all round in the end. Yeah, Kevin's been all over that and done sterling work, I've got to say. And uh, that's a good news story. What about your union, Jackass? Well, it's my old nemeses and I was uh uh, made public enemy number one on their November Twitter. Um, Extinction Rebellion, I'm not going to be the first one to do that this week, but obviously their, their blood sport stunt today, um, it's, it's pretty embarrassing to see a bunch of middle class people tell everyone else how to live their lives and be the foot soldiers for socialism. Though I will say, the girl with a shirt on that's been out there every day, you've made a very compelling argument that my DMs are open. There you go, that'll do nicely. Um, <laughs> union jackasses? Um, my, my one is the left-wing um, journalist, Paul Mason, who was first you know, on Newsnight as a reporter and has now released the book How to Stop Fascism. And I just think, you know, that he... 
an ardent Remainer has no self-awareness to realise that actually trying to overturn one of the biggest democratic votes um, is quite quite a significant thing, whereas he's trying to argue that actually fascism is on the rise in the UK, so I'm, I'm not sure that's the case. Great shout. Now, listen, <laughs> Peter, you're a very positive person, so I can't imagine you've got a union jackass, have you? Well, well sometimes I'm positive and I'm trying to be. So I've come on, you know, from a Labour Party perspective, and I just want to be comradely. I'm not going to nominate a jackass. I think in all walks of life, <laughs> including the Labour Party, we've got to try and be nice to each other. So um, no jackass tonight. Just say me, it. mate. Just say me. It. It's fine. I will drink to that. Uh, so many great emails. Uh, Ron, think of me. I'm 76. I use cash all the time. And Peter, if you don't love your pet and you're not distraught when your pet dies, why did you have a pet in the first place? Uh, Patrick Christie's is looking after the shop tomorrow. I'll see you on Monday.